What is home? Is it a shape, a squarish outline with a triangle top and a rectangle door you enter and exit? Is it a structure, the foundation that secures the dry wall covered studs that hold the roof over your head, a series of rooms separated by walls and connected by doorways? Certainly, it's a place where certain things happen. Waking and sleeping, coming and going, eating, fixing, fighting, forgiving. Or is home something internal, an idea or an ideal, where the things deep inside you come out? get expressed, and not just expressed, but accepted. Things like your dreams, your disappointments, your successes and failures, your hurt and your healing, your heart. Jesus said, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. So what if we kick division out, send it packing, out of our homes, yes, but also out of our hearts? And what if we ask the Lord to rebuild? Rebuild our hearts to see our home through His eyes. This one, this one, and this one. This place is worth praying for, working for, fighting for. These people are worth loving, serving, evangelizing. God decided they're worth dying for. Now it's time for you to decide. Home for my heart. This place these people, my privilege. What an amazing introduction that we just got to see to this year's vision, Home for My Heart. And we introduced that mantra to you that we're hoping that you adopt in three areas this year. Your family, those that you live with in your home, uh, the church, this church, and then finally the city that each of us live in. In where you are, we want you to have an increased level of ownership. So I'm sitting down with our executive leadership team, and we're going to be able to have a little bit of a conversation. These four men meet together weekly, talking about our vision, talking about where we're headed as a church, what our goals are, what ministries exist. And we thought it would be great to bring you in on that conversation. And hopefully by the end of this service today, you'll have a next step for each of those areas that we just discussed, your home, the church, and then the city. So we've included a little insert in your bulletin, and throughout our conversation today, we encourage you to write down a next step for each of those areas. But Pastor Skip, before we get into the vision for this year, let's take a step back. Okay. Why have a vision for the year at all? Well, uh, a vision, a statement of where you're going helps people understand our unique place. Um, every, there's so many different churches in a community, all of them, many of them have uh, a unique focus, a unique direction, and it's good to know who we are and why we exist mm. in the greater body of Christ, in a community. So, um, you know, there's an old scripture in Proverbs that says, without vision, the people perish. Yeah. I think that's kind of taken out of context. It's really without prophetic revelation, the people mm -hmm. perish. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, people need to know who they are, who they are uh, in relationship to people around them, and who they are in the community God has placed them in. Yeah. Well, Nate, you were a part of, you know, helping kind of craft based off of looking at where are we? Where does God have us marching forward? So tell us, where did this vision come from this year? How did that come to be? And was there anything cultural happening 
that contributed to that? Something that, that really I saw was dangerous happening um, throughout those COVID years in the church and in America, uh, and that was division. Yeah. And so one thing, a conversation we had a lot as an exec team in meetings is, how do we remind the church that it's good to be together? Yeah. It's good to be the church. It's good to be in person and get to see each other and, and you know, put aside maybe some of the uh, political differences or views on whatever aside yeah. and unite on the essentials, yeah. unite on the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He made a way for us to have a relationship with him and a relationship with each other. Yeah. And so as we began to think about that, um, those three phrases just kind of came into my mind, this place, these people, my privilege. And yeah. when I start to view my family that way, my church that way, and my city that way, it changes the way I treat people, but it also changes the way that I interact, the way that I get involved, and the responsibility and ownership that I take yeah. to make those things better. And, and, you know, I find you can't complain when you're thankful and when you're working to make something better. Mm -hmm. So I find the tendency in all of us, even in the city to which we're called, is to drive around and talk about the things we hate. Let's stop living our lives pointing at how things should be better or how we don't like it. Yeah. Let's get our hands dirty and yeah. get involved in it like Nehemiah, like Esther. Let's say this is our time to be invested and it's our privilege to do it. It's not a responsibility in the sense of I have to do it. It's an obligation. Mm -hmm. No, it's a joy. Yeah, yeah ownership will do that, right? I mean, right. when you... When you, when you take ownership, it's our problem. When you don't take ownership, it's that hmm. person's problem. They're the ones, the government, the mayor. Yeah. But when you take ownership, it's our problem. Yeah. Let's fix it. That's right. That's a really good point. And, and you had brought up a few biblical examples. Can you think of any passages that we drew inspiration from or people in Scripture that we looked at and said, yeah, they kind of embodied this vision, this mentality of ownership. Well, the first one that comes to my mind is Joshua, mm -hmm. who stood before the children of Israel. He gave a mandate to them. He kind of drew a dividing line, but he stood up and spoke for his family. He said, as for me and my house, mm -hmm. we will serve the Lord. Yeah. It's good. Another one is um, Jeremiah the prophet. He's in captivity. Mm -hmm. He writes a letter to the people in captivity, and he says, look, Seek the good of the people in which you find yourself yep. captive. Yeah. Take ownership of that place. Even though you're not, you're not a Babylonian, you are still an Israelite, yeah. you're there now. And while you're there, treat it like it's your own. Love the Mary. Uh, do what you can to bring peace in that place. Yeah. So that's fostering an ownership. You know, that, that's the passage we, we like to just not focus on except for Jeremiah 29, 11, sure, yeah. uh, which is a great promise, but it's in that context of taking ownership while you're in the captivity. Yeah, that's really good. good. Yeah, I think there's a lot of power in just thinking of where God has you, mm. you know, because in that context, it's like they're, they're in captivity. Not all of us, most of us are not forced to live where we are. We've chosen it. And yet, <clears throat> if we look at it through that biblical framework, we can think of the health of just putting roots down where we are and bringing, you know, seeking the best for the place that we are. Jen and I, you were talking about gratitude. Jen and I did this recently where we just said, okay, there's plenty of things that we could always nitpick about what could be better about life. Let's just write a list of all the things we love about our life. I saw this in a stationery shop one time and it said, the only normal people are the people you don't know well enough yet. Hmm. And you might even say the only normal places are the places you just aren't familiar enough with yet. Yeah. You might even say the only normal churches are the churches you don't know well enough yet. Yeah. And so the point being is that when we think of our Calvary Church family, whether we're local, whether, uh, you know, whether it's Albuquerque or Santa Fe or the state of New Mexico or our broader global church family community, yeah. Having had the opportunity to walk with Christ now for, for three decades and be a part of this church and learn of churches and pastors and people from around the world, we have so much to be grateful yeah. for that God mm. birthed us into this spiritual family or by virtue of moving or, or other events in life, we've been adopted into this family, Calvary Church. Yeah. Have. And as a result, because God's given us the opportunity to be a part of this family, we do have that privilege mm. of personal responsibility and ownership. Yeah. Mm. Amen. You know, I think so much of this, Matt, hinges on the word that we have as the moniker for Vision 2023, and that's home. Yeah. And, and I think home is such a critical word because when a place is your home, 
ownership follows along with it hand in hand. Yeah. When, when you're just living in a house and it's not your home and something happens, you call the landlord sure. because it's just a house. Yeah. Right. But when you've made roots and this is your home, mm-hmm. yeah, you don't think about whether you're going to fix the roof. You yeah. fix the roof when there's right. a leak. Yeah. You don't think about whether you want your yard to look good. You make your yard look good because it's your home. Right. Jesus Christ is the most prime example of this. Mm. He came to this earth because we are his people. Yeah. This is the place that he loves. So it was his privilege to die on the cross wow. for our sins. For no one drug him, him there. Yeah. No one forced him to go there. He did it joyfully because mm-hmm. it was his privilege. Yeah. I want to I wanna get to our next question. Um, you know, we've very intentionally crafted this in a way that we're starting with our family, and then moving to our church family, and then those that are living in our city. Kevin, you oversee our family ministries, and we've always said your first ministry, anytime that a pastor is coming on or a ministry leader, we say your family is your first ministry. Kind of flesh that out. What does that look like? What does that mean that your family is your first ministry? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts even if you you look at the pastoral qualification in 1 Timothy chapter 3. One of them is that you would lead your own household well. So how I've always thought of that is like, if I can't take care of the little congregation that's in my home, mm-hmm. how could I care for a larger congregation that's away from my home? And um, when, it, when we look at the pastoral qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, the, the thought is not that only pastors would line up to that, yeah. but that, that's kind of a template for the rest of the church. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, if God would call the pastors, the leaders of the church to govern their own households well, the idea would be that all of the rest of the church would be able to follow, that we would live lives that are not perfect, but that are exemplary in a way mm. where we're taking care of our own little congregations, pastoring, shepherding their, their hearts in, in our homes. And then that, that, like you said, concentric circles yeah. kind of goes out from there like a ripple effect. Yeah. You'll never look back on taking those moments of really pouring into your family and say, you know what, I, would, I wish I wouldn't have spent that two hours with my family. I yeah. wish I would have spent that two hours playing a video game or I wish I would have spent that time at work making more money. No, you're never going to regret having responsibility and ownership for your yeah. family. Or I'll put it in another way. I've never met a person at the end of his life or her life who regrets being too spiritual, spending too much time with their family, mm. yeah. praying too much, going to church and devoted to the things of the Lord right. too much. I've seen lots of regrets yeah. in the opposite direction. Yeah. Never that. Yeah. And, and, and the reality is you don't have to be married with kids to have responsibility over your family. Yeah. Right? You, don't, right. you don't have to be, you know, in a situation like we all are where we have kids living at home. You don't have kids living at home, but you still take responsibility <laughs> for your family. I have a puppy living at home. Does that count? <laughs> but I think you can be single and still take responsibility for your family, still mm-hmm. care for your parents. Or yeah. even yeah, let's say parents, you're siblings. single, your parents are passed away, you don't have kids, your home is still your home. Even if you're there by yourself, right. you still have a responsibility to make sure your home is a godly place mm. and that your home is honoring to the Lord. So yeah. there's still a, an element to that. Yeah, Nate, I'm so glad you mentioned that because in as much as family life and, and the responsibility of spouse and children uh, is a privilege, is an honor, uh, it in no way means that those who, for whatever reasons, are currently without that are any less yeah. Yeah. Uh, vital to the body of Christ mm-hmm. or less able to glorify God. So mm-hmm. for everyone out there who is in a different situation than the four of us are or have been, yeah. I'm very grateful that you brought that up. That's really good. Hey, this has been a great conversation around family, and we want to give you an opportunity to hear practical ways to put this vision in place in your home with your family. So let's watch this video, this conversation that Taylor and Gina had. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Taylor Braunis. I'm the family pastor and youth director here at Calvary Church. And I'm Gina Gonzalez, the children's ministry director. And we just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about how our church's vision plays out in family ministries. And Gina, I think especially as our Calvary Kids director, how do we see on a weekly basis Calvary Kids partnering with parents to give our kids a foundation of faith? We lock arms with parents while they train and raise their children. We wanna make sure that we create a safe and fun environment where kids feel comfortable coming Mm -hmm. in each week and having fun and getting to learn. Um, We wanna make sure that what we teach has substance. So we teach a age appropriate, chronological, biblical, Christ-centered Bible lesson every week. So Calvary Youth, after fifth grade, they move on up. How does Calvary Youth um, 
meet that vision and continue on building that foundation of faith. We are really trying to build on the foundation that these students are getting from Calvary Kids. So they're already, hopefully they've spent some time with the Bible, they, they're learning their way around it, but we're really trying to help them in Calvary Youth understand how does this apply to me? How does the Bible and the gospel apply to me as a middle schooler or a high schooler? And as we've made this transition to having a middle school worship service and a high school worship service, we're really trying to lean into being able to really meet students where they are and address the questions that they're asking. And we're really just trying to help them understand that the Bible isn't just something we learn about at church. This is something that, that has immediate relevance for them in their everyday lives. Nice. A big part, you know, for family ministries, especially Calvary Kids and Calvary Youth, parenting is a huge thing that we are always talking about. So Gina, could you tell tell me a little bit about how Calvary Kids comes alongside parents? Okay, so for date night, child care. So we kind of, we call it child care because there is a Bible lesson, but the child care for that um, looks a little different. It's now three hours of you know, activities and games and Bible lesson and worship. Um, so we wanna make sure, again, we're creating a safe, fun environment where parents can go and enjoy themselves either for date night or if it's the parenting um, classes, um, that they have that com comfort and confidence that their kids are being taken care of and having fun and they can go ahead and lean into the either the lesson or date night. Mm -hmm. So while we're caring for kiddos, Taylor, we're giving couples and parents what kinds of opportunities? Well, I think the reality is we just wanna find a way that as a church, how can we support couples as they're married and going through marriage? How can we support marriages? And also how can we support parents who are parenting? And rather than just simply doing a sermon series on parenting or marriages, which are important, we also just want to do practical things that are a blessing to yeah. couples and a blessing to parents. So date night, we all know sometimes as a married couple, it can be difficult to find time to go on a date. So we just thought, hey, well, what if Calvary Kids provides the child care so that a couple can go on a date? And with the parenting classes, we're just really trying to come alongside parents and we just want to give parents some practical tools that we can all use, whether you're, uh, you're a new parent or whether you've been parenting for a while, we can all do things better. And as a church, we just want to find out how can we all be better parents together? Well, and finally, well, as you know, Gina, Calvary Church, we are a pro-life church. We're adamantly, staunchly pro-life and we want to back that up. It's one thing to say that we're pro-life, but we're really trying to find ways how as a church can we come alongside families who are fostering and adopting. So we, we're partnering with other ministries. So think CareNet, Aspen Project, oh, yeah. Love Life. There's all these different ministries and partnerships that we're trying to build so that we can really pour into the foster and adoption community. And we want to make sure that we're supporting those families who've chosen to do that. Statistics tell a story, but our homes are not filled with statistics. In fact, we refuse to follow that storyline. Our spouses will know affection and have confidence in our commitment. Our children will experience intentional biblical parenting. Our families will witness us fight for growth, healing, and reconciliation. Let's open the doors to our homes saying, this place, these people, my privilege. Man, well, that's a great look at how you practically can get involved and take a next step with your family. But we're going to move from a uh, discussion around family now into our church family. And Neil, my first question is for you. What does the Bible, what's the Bible's prescription for a believer's involvement in church life? So with most of our common translations, we're familiar if we've been reading the New Testament with the phrase one another. And it's a Greek word, mm. alelon. Mm. It's used over 100 times in the New Testament. Mm. Wow. And 59 of those are regarding our relationships with one another. Yeah. So it's interesting that as you read through the New Testament, it's just assumed that we do not live this Christian life in isolation, yeah. but that we're living it together. And then you take it even further and you think about how we as the church are described as the body of Christ, like mm. the very body of Jesus Christ. And so you look at Ephesians 4 or Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12, and we're further described as a body in that each of us have a part in the body. Mm. And I think it's Romans 12, 17 that says, if, if everyone was an eye, where would the hearing be? Mm. In other words, somebody is 
a part of the body and, and all the parts need to be present for the body to function properly. Yeah. Hey, I have a question for you, Pastor Skip. In the earliest pages of the book of Acts, we are introduced to the early church, what we now call the early church. Uh, the way that they function then, is that still a good model for us today? Uh, yes and no. And I'm glad you differentiated the early part of the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. um, to be like the first church which is, I think, a template in the mm -hmm. book of Acts, is it's good to be like that. The early church of Corinth, not so much. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say, oh, I want to get back to the early church. Which one, I always say, because some of them were really wacky. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be like them. The book of Acts, yeah, it had its problems. It shows how they're dealt with. It shows mm -hmm. the priorities they were struggling to maintain. So that's a, that's a good one to shoot for. Okay. What principles, and maybe Nate, I'll ask you this question. What principles from, if we look at the early church, what things are we like, man, we want to emulate that more. I think one idea is having all things in common. I think that um, there's this beautiful sense in the church that we can pool our resources together to serve one another. Mm. And it means that just as with my own family, that if I see my kid or my wife hungry or hurting, I'm gonna use my resources to help meet their needs. Yeah. The same is true with the body of Christ. When I see a need, I meet a need. When I see a hurting brother or sister in Christ, I don't think about if I should do something, I do something. Sure, yeah. Because they're my brother, they're my sister. I love them, I care for them. So I think this idea of having all things in common, um, I've seen it play out so true in our connect group. You know, mm. we live life with these people. We say they're a real family. And when someone's in need, the connect group puts down whatever else they're doing to meet the need of that person yeah. and share their resources, their time, their money, their effort with those people yeah. because we love them. And how hard would it be, do you suppose, if somebody in the connect group didn't have the connect group but just had the need huh. and they're just going to church and observing and watching and no real connection. How hard would it be to get that need met? Very difficult. Yep, right. yeah. Not difficult at all when you're part of a smaller family. That's right. really yeah. great. Exactly. It's, it goes back to what you were saying, Neil, about one another 59 times, yeah. how we are to relate to one another in the New Testament. So if you think about it with that in mind, it's impossible to live a biblical New Testament Christian life isolated mm -hmm. and cut off. People are like, well, I don't need to go to church to go to heaven. I mean, technically that's true, but you, we need one another. And if we're going to follow Jesus in this New Testament age, we have to have one another. You were saying, how are you going to get those burdens taken yeah. care of? Well, Galatians 6, bear one another's burdens. Yeah. How, so how are you going to bear one another's burdens if you're isolated and cut off, either on a, a way, like you won't get your burden taken care of, yeah. but also you won't be there to take care of somebody else's burden. Yeah, right? you, so it goes both ways. You can get to heaven, but it'll be an unpleasant journey. Sure, yeah. that's good. That's I think there's true. a few markers of the early church. They were a learning church, yeah. and we are a church dedicated to doctrine. Mm -hmm. We set as the precedence for everything mm -hmm. we do as a church, the pulpit, to what you said, Neil. Mm -hmm. So we learned together. They were a learning church. They were a loving church. Mm -hmm. So they took what they learned and they put it into practice. So often, I think one of the problems we see in the modern day church today is a lot of people never put into practice what they're learning. Mm -hmm. So they're not letting that learn mm -hmm. become love into the, the society and the people that they're in. So they're a learning church, they're a loving church, they're a serving church, mm -hmm. and they're a giving church. And so I think those are all four things that we see in the early church of Acts that we can put into practice today in this day and age. Yeah. And that means also that the reality is at some point, if you haven't already had at Calvary, something happened that you disagree with, Get ready, because something at some point's gonna happen. You sure. say, I don't like that. Yeah. But when this is your home, wait, you don't I disagree just... with that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> when it's your home, you don't just split when things get hard. You don't good. just leave when you don't like something. No, you you dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm, right. You get more involved, and you be a part of changing maybe something that you don't like or something that you disagree with, or you go to the idea of in all things liberty, mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna have some charity with my other brothers and sisters in Christ, and you realize, hey. I don't like that, but they're still family. I still love them. Yep. So I'm not going to leave, and I'm not going to play the church hop game where I just go to a church that finally I like everything about until yeah. I find something I don't like, and I leave that one too. Right, no, right. you dig in because they're family. For those of you that are watching right now, you likely have a next step that the Lord has called you to. We would love to help you discover that. Right now, we have a conversation between Maria and Pastor Drew Voss, who's over our West Side campus. They're going to talk about uh, connect groups and life track. 
Well, hello, Calvary Church. My name is Drew. I am the Westside Campus Pastor, and we are so excited to be here with you. This is Maria. Maria, what do you do for the church? Um, well, my name is Maria Pardo, and I work with our Next Steps team, working with Life Track and Connect Groups and getting people onboarded to serving here at the church. So cool. Well, yeah. thank you for doing that. Uh, we are here today to talk with you about, hey, how do we get engaged in the church? How do we get plugged in here? Because there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, and primarily, what I tell people is Connect Groups, Life Track, and hey, we do events every now and then, just being a part of those. So Maria, you're brand new. This is the first time you've ever walked into Calvary Church. What would you tell people to do to get involved? First thing I would say is if you don't have a connect group, that is the main priority, the main way you can get connected and build a community within our church. It can be kind of scary, like coming in and seeing the size of our church. And what I encourage people is it gets a lot smaller when you know people and connect groups are the way to do that. I know one of the hardest parts about church, especially the culture we live in and the era we live in is feeling like you're disconnected and you don't have people to walk through life with. The mm. church is so far against this. We have been bought and brought into a family and connect groups are a really great way to be diligent about that. And not just like, hey, come and go, pass and leave. You can do that on a Sunday morning, but connect groups is a way for you to get to know people and be known by them and really know someone who's praying for you and loves you and cares about you. Another way is to get involved with serving. Um, a lot of times when you serve, you end up realizing you're alongside the people who've got that common interest and become mm -hmm. like family. So whether you're in a connect group or you're on a serving team, which we call life teams, that's another great way to get about getting family and really connected into the church. Okay. So And yeah. so serving team, life teams are all the same thing. What how do you what's the avenue into that? So the avenue into that is through life track, which is one of my favorite things. Every now and then we have fast track where we do all three of those sessions in a four hour chunk where okay. we make sure we get you caffeinated and something in your belly and get you going. Um we if have it's caffeinated, I'm there. Yeah. We have our next fast track that you're gonna be teaching on June 17th, right? coming up? I hope so. If I'm teaching it, I'd probably want to be there. I yeah. think you'll be there. Okay. So cool. that fast track, you can register for that since we are planning four hours and we want to be ready for everybody. Okay. They can go to our events page, register, then we'll be ready for them. Other than that though, we have life track every month um, on the first Sunday of the month on Sunday morning at 11, which is great for families because they can also use the childcare, Calvary kids. Life hack. Yes. Wow. Definite life hack. Um, and then they can go through all those three steps each month as well. Well, hey, thank you so much for being part of uh, our little conversation here. And we are praying for you and your next step getting involved in Calvary Church. Division has crept into this home, this family, as comparison, complaining, and complacency. But we defy division when we decide to give, to serve, to equip and to encourage and to pray for the people in this house. This is God's house. These are God's people. Walk through the door to God's house declaring, this place, these people, my privilege. Well, hopefully that conversation between Maria and Drew helped you discover a next step for you to take. Before we transition into talking about the city, uh, Nate, I'd like to ask you, what does it look like for our Calvary Church at home, the people living in Melbourne, the people living in South Africa, how can they be involved in the church and in serving? Yeah, I think I'd take it a step back even further from serving. And I would just say that each and every one of us who calls Calvary Church our home has a next step of mm. how we can take more ownership and responsibility. And that doesn't just have to be serving. Mm. You know, we can hear all this about the church and what we're doing. It can be very easy to say, home for my heart. I live 3,000 miles away mm. in another home. How can I make this my home? Yeah. Um, but I think if we each find that one area to to take more personal responsibility, and that's what we can do. And so for you, watching at home 3,000 miles away, that could mean taking notes 
during church. Uh, That could mean inviting one other person into your home to watch church with. That could mean launching a watch party in a coffee shop. That could mean attending online life track or joining an online connect group. You don't just have to be in New Mexico or even in America to make Calvary Church your home. All you have to do is take some more ownership and responsibility and stop just consuming content and finding ways to connect. You know, that's one of the things I love about Lifetrack is one, it is an onboarding process to serving, but it's also just a great way to connect with a church. Right. If you mm-hmm. consider Calvary yeah. your home church, then go through Lifetrack because you're going to discover more about this church and the people in it. I would mm-hmm. add one more to that, and I would say that would be giving. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that. Uh, where our dollars go shows where our heart is. Mm. So if you consider Calvary Church your home church, you watch every week online, you don't go to another church in your city, but you're not giving, you're only partially invested in how the Lord would want you to be invested mm. into making it your home. Yeah. And, and that plays out real practically too in our campus ministry. Yep. That's right. So, you know, Santa Fe campus, Westside campus, these are our places where as a church, we, we reach out into those different pockets of those cities. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the vision that Pastor Skip's always given us for campus ministry is that at each campus, the, the core values and the teaching are the same, but they're culturally unique or culturally diverse. And so you go to the Calvary Santa Fe campus, and it feels very different than Osuna, but it's got this great Santa Fe vibe. West Side feels very different than Osuna, but it's got a great West Side vibe. Same core values, same teaching, but take ownership of yeah. it. Step into, uh, you know, serving at Calvary Santa Fe is gonna look a little different than serving at Calvary Osuna. Yeah. That's okay. Own what it is, step into your role in it, and that's how it all plays out, whether Cape Town or Santa right. Fe mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Well, I'd like to transition from that second circle. You know, we've talked about the family, the church. I'd like to talk about the city now. Why, Pastor Skip, does this vision this year have an emphasis at all on reaching our city? Because in the words of Jeremiah, uh, you know, he said, seek the good of mm. the city to which you are called captive. Mm. Mm. Amen. And um, he was speaking to the children of Israel. They were not Babylonians, but they're living in Babylon. Um, Some of them actually loved it so much they didn't go back home. So they learned to really integrate, maybe to a fault. They got too comfortable. But his, his counsel was get married, be responsible, and seek the good of the city, the people, the government. It's a pagan government. And so, you know, it's, well, I'm not of this world. And... But you're in it, and because you're in it, you have a responsibility to it. And um, look, we as the church are trying to attract people to Jesus Christ. If we don't integrate into the world system, being in the world but not of the world, there's not going to be any way to really reach people for Christ. So Hmm. you got to love the city so people feel the hook. That's the hook of the gospel. Yeah. The hook isn't a clever argument, an apologetic. Ooh, you really got me. There's enough of that. People want to feel and, 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 and see the love. That becomes the hook that draws mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. where you as a fisher of men get to take the next step in evangelism. Yeah. Tim Absolutely. Keller, the late great Tim Keller, who mm-hmm. recently passed away, said that when the world sees us doing evangelism and making converts, all they see us doing is trying to increase our numbers and increase our power. When they see us loving those who can do nothing for us in return, they see that what we believe might actually be rooted in something wow. true. And so that's where this love element comes in. We love our neighbors. We love those who are in our city because that love hopefully is going to open a door to preach the gospel to them. You know, I was reading Nehemiah earlier today, and as Nehemiah is confronted with the news of everything that's happening in Jerusalem, his heart breaks and he starts weeping. And I would just encourage those of you who are watching right now, maybe you're in a place where you're like, I don't really love the people of my city. I don't really love this place. Pray to God that he would give you a broken heart for the people so that you can say, hey, this place, these people, it's my privilege to be here and to love them. And, you know, we tell people to write something down, take the next step, and I think it's important we do. But I'm also going to say if you're not sure what that is, Mm. that may be like Nehemiah, who went to Jerusalem, surveyed the walls, and didn't tell anyone what God had put in my heart to do, until he did, yeah, it's good. that you pray and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Make yourself a living sacrifice, yeah. right? Here I am, 
take me, send me. Then when we hear from him, we write it down That's and get engaged. Because you don't want to get engaged on false pretenses. Yeah. One of the things that you just said, Pastor Skip, is that we should leave it better than we found it. Mm-hmm. Now, Neil, you've lived in Albuquerque your whole life in this surrounding area. Um, how would you s- say you've seen the church be a change agent for good in our city? When it comes to our church family, Calvary Church, as a native New Mexican born and raised here in Albuquerque, and living my first 19 years mm. without a relationship with Christ, mm. and then get, getting beautifully blindsided by the Lord, coming to a radical conversion at age 19, and thinking what my life is like, and my parents, my family's lives who've come to know Christ are like, since they too have come to know Christ through this church, I literally cannot fathom Albuquerque mm. without God having sent Skip Heitzig to this city to establish his body through Pastor Skip here. And from that specific body, my relationship with Christ came to be. It is astounding to me that in almost every church, their leadership, much less their their body and, and those that serve, there's been a season where God has had many of them train, learn, serve here within this church family. Yeah, that is for sure. I think when you get down to it, we're in the home renovation business. Hmm. You know, we were talking about this idea that this is not our home, our home is in heaven. But Jesus told us in the Lord's prayer, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. So that means our job over here on earth is to make this home look a little bit more like our home. Oh, yeah. Mm, we're, we're in the renovation business. Yeah. We're renovating this place. Our goal should be to make this place look a little bit more like the home that we're going to. Yep. Right. And and that's what we get to do. On that's earth right. as it is in heaven. Yeah. In Albuquerque as it is in heaven. That's right. Yeah. A divine makeover. That's right. I love that. Well, Nate, you had brought up a, a quote from Tim Keller, and that has been really inspiration for something that we're going to be talking about soon, uh, Love Week. And actually, to talk about that, here is Koi and Janae. My name's Koi Trammell, and I'm here with Janae Heitzig, and together we oversee the community outreach and special events team here at Calvary. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we're practically going to work out and live out the vision that we've just communicated, how we're going to practically love and serve our city. Well, Koi, you and I work together on a lot of these large outreach and events, and we do things like Freedom Celebration. We do things like the Thanksgiving Food Drive Love Week. We have things coming down the pike. Why don't you tell us what the heart is behind these and why we do what we do? Sure, I mean, I think us as a church, We see serving our city as both a responsibility and a privilege. When we when we get saved and Jesus touches our heart, his love compels us to want to do something about it. And so this is us saying, hey, we don't want to just sit back. We want to go and do something about making our city better. And so that's what we we try to do when we do things like Freedom Celebration or Love Week or or list off any of the things we do. It's our heart to say, hey, how can we take up arms? How can we pick up a shovel? What can we do to make sure we're making an impact and being an agent of change in our city? Yeah, that's good. I think Freedom Celebration, one of those big events, is more of our way of reaching out to the public and bringing them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But then those outreaches, like Love Week, is an opportunity for us to get our hands dirty and to serve our city, those people who are in need, whether that be the homeless or orphans or caring for our city's parks and things like that that are practical, things that don't take much effort and don't take a specific talent, but just take a person with a heart and the willingness to do it. I think 2019 was the last time we did Love Week. And really we were just compelled this year to to bring it back as a practical way to love our city again as an outgrowth of our vision this year to make sure that we are um, practically um, taking responsibility and seeing our city as as a, as a home for our heart. And we're making sure that we're going out and loving people. And so that's what the whole heart behind it is, is we're going out and we're practically for a week long just saying, how can we help? Well, our vision is this place, these people, our privilege. And out of that idea, we birthed several new ideas on how we want to serve our city and, and serve the church. 
why don't you tell me a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So this year we implemented park parties and really that was our heart's desire to minister to our congregants, to our church family and creating an environment where something as simple as hanging out at a park with some friends, fellow believers, maybe a few yard games and some music can minister to their hearts and create community. Also, um, last Thanksgiving was the first time that we introduced the Thanksgiving pickup party on our campus, and that was to a whole new caliber, a new scale, and we're excited this year as we move into that to expanding that vision and really ministering to the hurting families in um, our community and around the city and even on the outskirts of the city. We really want to continue moving on that pathway forward and um, expanding that idea. Same thing with the toy drive. The toy drive was introduced to our campus. We've been doing it for many years, but introduced to our campus where we got to facilitate handing out these gifts to these needy families. And it was just a blessing to watch the community come together, our church body, as well as the community um, team with that. So we're really excited and looking forward to how that will play into our vision this year. Most people see this city this home as a place filled with problems, but we see a place that Jesus loves, filled with people he died for. We will embrace ownership of our city by championing positive change, becoming active participants in shaping its future as we proclaim, this place, these people, my privilege. Well, I think that we can all agree that the needs of our city, the city that we're in, but probably the city that you might be in as well if you're part of our global family, those needs are deep. Um, but I'm reminded of a quote Warren Wearsby said, he defined ministry as this, that ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels. That's all of us to the glory of God. All of us. All of us, all of us. And so uh, we hope that you would find a next step. We believe that, that God wants you to be a loving channel through which he works through to meet the needs of the people in your city, in your place. But one final question to put a bow on it. Okay. We've talked a lot about vision. We've talked a lot of uh, passages from scripture. What's the one thing that you would hope people leave with as a result of this conversation? Well, um, Isaiah heard from the Lord, and he said, here I am, send me. He heard of the need, and he volunteered. He stepped up. Here I am, send me. A lot of times we hear that, and we go, here I am, send Matt, mm. send Neil, <laughs> send Nate, send Kevin. Yeah. Here I am, send me. What, what is your role? Mm. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's you have on. a ministry to fulfill. Yeah. Are you sure that you have fulfilled what God has called you to do. What is the next step? And there is one for all of us to take to fulfill our ministry. Well, thank you for wrapping it up. Here I am, Lord, send me. And we're praying that those of you who are watching, whether it's online or maybe you're at one of our in-person campuses, that this would be a great conversation for you to hear, but then also to put in practice. And so we're providing a few resources. We've got this uh, insert in your bulletin. It's both online and in person. Do grab this, pray about it like Pastor Skip was saying. Pray about what your next steps are. Write it down and keep this. Maybe keep it uh, on the countertop so that when you're getting ready in the morning in the bathroom, you can say, oh yeah, I took those next steps or put it on your refrigerator for your family to see. And before you get onto that, I hate to interrupt you, but let me just say as pastor of this church, really do this. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's really tempting to see a bulletin insert uh, uh, for the outline and stuff or the, something like this. And yeah, 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 and just leave it there. But really, just do that. Take yeah. it, pray about it, and then write something down. Share it with your family. Yeah. And see what difference the Lord uses that for. That's really Look great. back next year at those things that mm, you put exactly. in practice and see how your family, your mm. city, 
and your church are different because yeah, of it. Good, Nate. That's really great. We also wanted to provide this Vision magazine. The team did a really great job on this. There are articles in here about our vision, but also the practical outworkings of that vision. This is available, again, online or in person in our foyers if you're at one of our physical locations. And uh, this conversation ended up being a lot longer than just what you saw right now. So we'll have the full thing posted online on our YouTube, and you'll see a link the week of Vision Week. But thanks for being with us, and our prayer is that you would say, here I am, Lord, send me.